Uh, welcome to the Lyceum, an important place in which to have our lectures and civic dialogue and, and such. I'm Bill Dickinson. I have the honor of being president of the Alexandra Historical Society, which is a co-sponsor of this evening's lecture. You have to remember, this is an all-volunteer organization, so we're only as good as you all allow us to be and to help out. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, the uh, Alexandria Historical Society, for co-sponsoring this series with us this year, the Office of Historic Alexandria. I'm Jim McKay, the director of the Lyceum and apparently freshly minted board member of the Historical Society. Um, welcome to our, our lecture. Um, if you've been coming to the other ones and following along, we've covered the uh, pretty much the full gamut of um, uh, historical topics that, that we can uh, tease out of this event and um, we're going to return to a little closer to home uh, tonight where Steve Vogel is going to focus on those several weeks that he's written about in his book that really uh, defined what happened in, in this area and, and focus in on DC and Alexandria. I also wanted to mention the upcoming concert series. Bill mentioned the, the next lecture but um, the War of 1812 concert series, we have flyers for this downstairs. You can't miss it because it's electric blue um, down there on the counter. This will be on the terrace at the Carlisle House. Uh, each program will be from 6 to 8 p.m. And the first one is coming up June 5th. So get, get one of these flyers before you leave and make a note of those programs. It's through the, through the month of June on Thursdays. I guess it's every Thursday in June. Is that that's right, Helen? Okay. Uh, and they are free, as opposed to our whopping $5 charge that we're sticking you for here for these lectures. Um, on to Steve. Steve Vogel grew up in Alexandria where he worked for both the Journal and the Port Packet. Uh, but today he's a reporter for the Washington Post covering military affairs and, and veterans issues. In earlier assignments he covered the war in Iraq and the first Gulf War, U.S. military operations in Rwanda, Somalia, and the Balkans as well as the terrorist attack on the Pentagon on September 11th, 2001, which I think we all well remember in this room, except for maybe the young man in the back who may not have been uh, following the news back then. Uh, six years later, Random House published uh, Steve's book on this iconic building and its history, uh, a book on the Pentagon itself. Steve's a graduate of the College of William and Mary, and he also holds a master's degree in international public policy from Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies. Tonight we've asked him to speak to us about another book he's written, Through the Perilous Fight, an account of the Chesapeake Campaign during the War of 1812 and published by Random House uh, last May. And as hopefully most of you are aware, we do have uh, a number of copies of uh, Steve's book, uh, Through the Perilous Fight, for sale in our museum store uh, downstairs, and he will be available after the lecture and our little question and answer uh, session downstairs by the store to sign copies of those if you'd like to purchase one. Looking at the size of the crowd in the room, I should have bought probably more copies, but we have 18 of them down there, or actually 16, because I think Gretchen bought one already, and uh, we're going to put one in our library. So you got to bolt down there if you want a copy tonight. Otherwise, don't worry about it. I will get more, and uh, we'll have them here in our store for you. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let's get Steve up here. Steve Vogel. Uh, thanks very much. It's, it's a real pleasure to be back here. Um, it's, it's kind of deja vu. Uh, partly because um, it was a great honor a month ago to, to receive your history award uh, named after Michael Miller, who a uh, historian here in Alexandria who I, I worked with when I first started as a reporter at the uh, Port Packet back in 1982. He was a, an endless font of information on all things Alexandria, really all things Virginia history. Um, and uh, just looking back on that time, I, I have to say that um, you know, con considering some of the places I went uh, later on as a reporter, uh, Alexandria was a good training ground for war zones and anywhere else that I ended up. It was, it was an exciting time uh, in, the, in the 1980s uh, with some uh, 
charismatic politicians, and um, um, it's, it's great to be back in the city. I wanted to say special thanks to Patsy Tyser uh, uh, for, for coming, and <laughs> it's good to see you again. Yeah. Thank you. And, and to Lonnie Rich, uh, another um, voice from, from those days that, that I knew, and uh, um, also uh, remembering to uh, Chuck Beatley and Vola Lawson and a lot of uh, other great Alexandrians uh, who um, were really uh, a shining light for a young reporter. Um, thanks also to, I see Mike Jenkins, who was the cartoonist at the Journal Papers, is, is here. So, And uh, representing my, my family uh, who live in Alexandria is my brother, Peter. Um, thanks for coming. My, my mom would be here, but she had a, a party on her hall at Goodwin House, so <laughs> she couldn't make it. PSA. <laughs> um, she's heard the, the talk, though, so. <laughs> um, let me turn this on. I just wanted to, uh, I know that uh, we've had some, some talks about the War of 1812. I just wanted to really briefly uh, touch on the, the root causes just to set the, the framework for um, what happened here in Alexandria and, and the Chesapeake region in general. Um, one thing we always have to remember is that this war was really an offshoot of what had been going on in, in Europe for basically 20 years um, since uh, France had declared war on England in 1793. And uh, this war had become even more desperate uh, in the in the last 10 years um, since the rise of Napoleon. And uh, by 1812, when, when the United States declared war on, uh, on Great Britain, Napoleon was in control of, of most of Europe. And Great Britain saw itself as the bulwark against Napoleon. And uh, in that uh, fashion, it, Great Britain didn't hesitate to trample on American sovereignty to try to win this war. And if that included stopping American ships at sea and uh, impressing sailors and, uh, and putting them to work on Royal Navy ships uh, because they desperately needed the manpower, so be it. Um, they were also blocking American trade with uh, the rest of Europe. And you know, hence the slogan that we say, see here, free trade and, and sailors' rights. That was certainly one of the root causes of, uh, that led to the American declaration of war. Um, for, for President Madison, uh, of course, he'd had a, a lifetime of, of enmity with, uh, with Great Britain, uh, going back really to his days uh, uh, as one of the um, uh, patriots who, who uh, would go on to more or less be the, the prime architect of the Constitution. And he had served as Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson. And uh, during that period, uh, the United States came close several times, particularly in 1807, to go, going to war with Great Britain. And by 1812, uh, Madison had come to the conclusion that if the United States were to continue uh, to, to allow Great Britain to trample its sovereignty this way, we might as well still be a vassal state. Uh, we might have won our freedom a generation earlier, but we hadn't really won our independence. And with the, uh, the support of uh, a group in Congress known as the War Hawks, who, who also had their, their eye on Canadian territory, um, the United States, ver by a very narrow margin, agreed to, to um, go to war. This, uh, this was a very uh, controversial, divisive decision. And you know, many Americans of the day, including many in this region, uh, were opposed to it. You know, among them, Francis Scott Key, uh, kind of ironic. We, we, we think of him as the author, of course, of the most patriotic of all American songs. But, he was deeply and passionately against this war, um, thought it was a, a terrible mistake for the United States, which, which by the way, had a, a, a tiny military, just a, a, a few ships capable of, of going to sea, uh, a very small army, terrible officer corps, uh, going to war with, with one of the great powers on Earth, uh, the Royal Navy with a thousand ships. Um, and Key actually was so appalled by the U.S. conduct uh, of this war that the United States launched several invasions uh, to try to gain Canadian territory as part of uh, the negotiating strategy. And those failed miserably. And 
And Key actually celebrates this. He writes to John Randolph uh, of Virginia, one of the, uh, the congressmen and leading opponents of the war, and he, he says, uh, uh, as your Patrick Henry said, this may be treason, but if so, I, I embrace the name traitor. So that, that gives you an idea of, of what the, uh, the sentiment was in the time. Now, for the first couple of years of the war, uh, the war was not really going well for either the United States or, or Great Britain, frankly. All these invasions of Canada had failed for the United States, but Great Britain was so tied up with fighting Napoleon, they, had, they hadn't been able to uh, devote much in the way of resources to, um, uh, to the United States. And that changes uh, with the arrival of uh, Admiral George Coburn and a Royal Navy squadron in the, uh, the spring of 1813. And Coburn was one of uh, Nelson's uh, finest lieutenants. He had um, um, actually gained great confidence uh, uh, or the confidence of Nelson fighting uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, and the uh, Admiralty in London decides that they need to shake things up a little bit uh, on the North American station. And they send Coburn uh, to be second in command. There was a, a British historian who was uh, held prisoner, uh, or rather detained in Philadelphia at the outbreak of war. And uh, he would later write that until Coburn's arrival, the people of the Chesapeake region would have only known by hearsay that there was a war going on. And uh, that was about to change. And uh, with the uh, attack on Havre de Grace and a number of other towns uh, along the shores of the Chesapeake and the rivers feeding into the Chesapeake um, in 1813 and then continuing into 1814, uh, Coburn served notice that uh, the United States and the, the Chesapeake region, which was the geographic, economic, and, and political heart of America, uh, was at war. Uh, and, and Coburn, in fact, was really practicing a, a form of, um, of what, what uh, Sherman uh, would practice a half century later in Georgia, this, a, f a form of total warfare, basically bringing the war to the civilian population to, to make them feel the pain and, and to uh, undermine support for the war. And, uh, scenes like this really uh, shook Washington uh, when, when news of this and uh, the rape of Hampton and uh, numerous towns and plantations in Virginia and Maryland. Uh, this area was de entirely dependent on militia for defense because our, our tiny army was up on the Canadian frontier launching feudal invasions. So the, the militia were, uh, were very fearful of leaving their homes because no one knew where Coburn was going to strike next. And uh, if, a, a, if a home was abandoned, uh, Coburn would take that as, as uh, meaning that the owner had joined the militia, so he, he would burn it. If the owner stayed to defend the, the house, that was a hostility towards Great Britain, so it could be burned for that as well. So it was a, a tough time in the Chesapeake. But Coburn, uh, had, had visions of something greater than, than these raids. And he very early on um, realized that the defenses in this region were so pathetic that um, he felt with just a little bit of, uh, of uh, reinforcement in the form of some British Army troops, he could, he could take uh, the capital of the United States. And he sent uh, uh, notes and uh, memorandum back to the Admiralty and to his uh, his superior officer in Bermuda, Alexander Cochran, advising just that. Um, the, the Chesapeake, as you can uh, probably know, but you can see here, really served as a great highway uh, into this region. Uh, and this was a British lake. Uh, let me see if I have the, the laser working here. Yeah. Um, and Coburn set up uh, a base of operation down at Tangier Island. Um, which was convenient both to the mouth of the, uh, the Potomac and the Patuxent Rivers. Uh, and from there, he encouraged uh, a lot of African-American slaves to, to uh, more or less escape and come join the British. And they were promised their freedom uh, and an opportunity, if they, they wished, to, to fight their former masters. And, and thousands uh, took them up on the offer. And, uh, Coburn on Tangier formed a, uh, uh, a regiment of colonial marines, as they were known, and they proved to be very effective 
not only uh, as good fighters, but also because they knew the water uh, and the land better in many cases than their former masters. Um, Coburn uh, uh, had in mind, very early on, he realized that the Patuxent River was going to be a, uh, the key to his uh, attacking Washington. I'll, I'll get more into that in a second. In uh, April of 1814, one of the most important developments of the entire war takes place uh, with the abdication of Napoleon. And this very suddenly uh, gives Great Britain the opportunity to send a lot more force over to North America. And Coburn uh, gets his wishes granted uh, and a force of about 4,000 men under General Robert Ross are sent to the Chesapeake. Um, another force is sent up uh, to Canada to reinforce the, the troops up there. And uh, with, with this reinforcement in North America, Great Britain's hoping to uh, you know, force a peace on, on their terms. So Ross uh, arrives in the Chesapeake in, in August of 1814. And uh, rendezvous along with uh, Admiral Cochrane, who was the commander of the North American Station, and with uh, Coburn in the Chesapeake, mid-August. Coburn's uh, proposal, uh, and he, he met a lot of skepticism from both Ross and Cochrane on this. Uh, his idea was, uh, he, he tried to convince him that Washington was indeed vulnerable. And, and Ross and Cochran could hardly believe that the capital of, of a fairly large country would be so vulnerable. Um, so Cochran uh, uh, agrees only after Coburn takes General Ross ashore uh, in St. Mary's and shows how, how uh, weak the defenses are. And Ross uh, is convinced as well. Coburn's uh, idea is to launch a three-pronged attack. Essentially, there would be uh, one large feint going up the Potomac River to threaten Alexandria and Washington, uh, smaller feint going up the Chesapeake uh, to interfere with communications and uh, perhaps threaten Baltimore. Uh, but the main force with the army under, uh, under General Ross would sail up the Patuxent River as far as it could go and, and land. And uh, Coburn's idea was that the Potomac, in a way, was the most obvious route if you're going to be attacking Washington. Um, and if they sailed up the Potomac alone, then uh, the Americans would know what the, the target was. But Patuxent was, was more muddled. Um, it could mean an attack on Washington. It could mean an attack on Annapolis. It could be that the Americans, uh, that the British were only after Commodore Joshua Barney, who, who had a flotilla operating uh, and had been more or less stuck in the Patuxent River. Uh, so it al allowed a, a lot of opportunity for British um, um, disguising their, their moves. And, and this is what happens. The, the British land at Benedict uh, on August 19th. This is basically as far upriver as they can sail with their large ships. And the, the uh, army force goes up by land. And then a smaller force in, in small barges under Coburn continues up the um, Patuxent, trying to, um, to uh, get uh, Joshua Barney and, and his uh, flotilla, which is hiding uh, further up towards Lower Marlboro. Now, um, of course, word of, of this has, has arrived in Washington, uh, in Alexandria, that uh, the British have arrived in the Chesapeake in force. This wasn't a great surprise. Uh, from the moment Napoleon abdicates, uh, reports started coming across the Atlantic that the British were, were coming over in force. And Madison had recognized that uh, Washington was a target and had ordered his Secretary of uh, War, John Armstrong, to take some measures uh, in defense. Armstrong had pretty much dismissed uh, this possibility and uh, had done very little to, um, to carry out the orders. Um, and there, the American um, commander of the militia forces in Washington, General William Winder, was given very little support. Um, militia troops um, were not called up until very late in the game, and they weren't given much in the way of arms. In Alexandria, 
there had been a long recognition that um, the city was very vulnerable. Basically, uh, the, the only defense of Alexandria was going to rest on um, both the uh, two things, really. The kettle bottoms, which were shoals uh, in R, shoals in the Potomac. And it was thought that highly unlikely that ships carrying the, the sort of armament that the British were carrying would be able to sail past these shoals, very notorious, difficult sailing terrain. And the other uh, great hope was, uh, was Fort Washington, um, which was uh, at the, um, where the Piscataway Creek runs into the Potomac. It was on a site that George Washington, of course, you know, lived across the river at, at Mount Vernon, had recognized early on was a, a very strategic point from the, the bluff up there, uh, a, uh, a fort could command the, bat, uh, the, um, the channel, which runs right underneath the, uh, the Maryland shore there. Um, and this fort uh, had been constructed, but unfortunately it wasn't constructed very well. And by 1814, the uh, condition of the guns and the garrison there was, was pretty shoddy. Um, let me go back for a second just to uh, uh, carry the story about Bladensburg forward. I'm not going to speak about Bladensburg too much because I want to get to what happens uh, with Alexandria. But uh, just to, to, uh, to go over it briefly, uh, the British strategy works perfectly. These, uh, the disguised movement and then uh, further feints once they land at, at Benedict under General Ross they, they are constantly marching in one direction, fainting in, an, in another way, heading, doubling back, uh, heading north. General Winder is com completely flummoxed by what the intentions are. And there's a lot of speculation that, oh, well, the British are just going to uh, capture Barney and destroy the flotilla, then they're going to get back on their, their ships and sail away. Or maybe they're just going to attack Fort Washington by land. Or um, you know, perhaps Annapolis is the target. Now, many people were saying, no, Washington is the target. Uh, Armstrong com uh, continues to dismiss this. And within five days, the, uh, the British have moved up uh, closer past uh, Upper Marlboro. And with a final feint directly towards the city, they instead moved north towards Bladensburg. And General Winder um, had his, uh, his troops were, were paralyzed, basically, in Washington as the British are heading to Bladensburg. And so there's a, there's a race on the morning of August 24th to get to Bladensburg. Um, and while the Americans had some force there, the British uh, veteran troops uh, that had been sent over, many of them had fought under Wellington, uh, were uh, more than a match for the American militia that sets up on the eastern branch, uh, what we know today as the Anacostia. And General Ross doesn't hesitate once he gets his men in position. He sees that the Americans are not, um, are still bringing up forces from Washington. And he orders an immediate assault across the river, um, envelops the militia, and then has to make a, a, a run against the, the final line of defense, uh, which is anchored by Commodore Barney and his flotilla men who have whose flotilla has been destroyed, but they've, they've come up uh, with guns to uh, line the, the, the border between Maryland and the district. And there's quite a fight there. We, we all we hear about the Bladensburg races, and um, there's sometimes a, a feeling that this was a, a big joke, but there's actually some very serious fighting that goes on. The British are doing a lot of the fighting, certainly doing a lot of the, the dying. They, they uh, take heavy casualties um, heading uphill on this horrifically hot day, 100 degree, uh, you know what August is like in, in this region. And Barney, and, uh, who was reinforced by US Marines, uh, inflicted many casualties. Uh, but eventually, they run out of ammunition, and the, the British uh, force Barney's surrender. So they enter Washington that night. They're not wasting any time. Uh, Coburn and Ross held the belief that uh, by capturing Washington, perhaps capturing Madison, destroying the, f the federal government buildings, uh, they would so disgrace and humiliate the American government that, that Madison would be forced to sue for peace. Um, and this was uh, a, a lot of the uh, uh, 
guiding a lot of what would happen. The, uh, the British, because Ross is now in charge, are actually quite respectful of uh, private property in Washington. Coburn had, had torched many private homes, but General Ross uh, insists that only the federal buildings be torched. Now, this of course includes uh, the Capitol, uh, the White House, uh, Treasury, uh, the Navy Yard is, is burnt by the Americans themselves to keep it from falling into uh, British hands. Uh, but essentially every, every vestige of American power is destroyed uh, in the next 24 hours. There's Admiral Coburn. As, as you can see, he feels pretty badly about the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, yeah, he, he, he really um, relished this moment and uh, rides down personally to, to make sure that the, uh, uh, the White House is completely gutted uh, before he's satisfied. Now, the British are not staying long in, in Washington. And this is uh, um, sometimes a, a source of, of some puzzlement. But this is a pretty small force. You know, 4,000 men uh, in, the, in the heart of the enemy country this is tiny compared to these enormous armies that have been fighting in Europe, 100,000 plus. And uh, the, the British were anxious to get the force back to the ships so they could continue attacking other cities, Baltimore, New Orleans, high on the list of, uh, of possible targets. And they, uh, they were not well supplied. They had very little artillery. Uh, all, most of their cavalry was in the form of, of captured farm horses and the like. So uh, there's also a storm that comes in that, uh, you know, unbelievably powerful, uh, basically a line of, of thunderstorms that uh, sparks one or more tornadoes. And this does a lot of destruction both to the American uh, homes in Washington uh, in the surrounding region and to the British ships on the Potomac and Patuxent. And um, this brings us back to, to uh, the British force that's been sailing up the Potomac all this time um, under Captain James Gordon. So we still have the, the three prongs in effect here. Now Gordon, um, very capable officer. Uh, he had fought as well under Nelson. He'd lost a leg in the Adriatic uh, a couple of years earlier. Uh, this is a picture, this portrait is done later in his life, uh, but he was only 31 years old at the time. Now when the, uh, the British uh, it had it, it taken them five days to get through Kettle Bottoms. It was, uh, they had to, they ran aground about 20 times and had to pull their ships through with anchors, but merely getting through um, was, was quite a, a feat of seamanship, and that blasted one hope of uh, the Alexandrians as to the defenses. Um, by the time that uh, Washington is burning, Gordon and his uh, squadron are here at Maryland Point. And they can see from that point, you know, more than 20 miles away, they can see the flames, the, the sky is lit up. Uh, in fact, these flames are visible as far away as uh, Frederick, Maryland, Fredericksburg, and Baltimore. It's just an enormous um, um, inferno, uh, particularly the Navy Yard, which is stocked with um, all sorts of timber and tar and, and other flammable materials. Now, when, they, when Gordon sees that Washington is already burning, he considers turning around, um, but decides to go ahead for two reasons. One is that he knows that Ross's force is pretty small, and it's possible that they could be trapped in Washington, and if so, they would need the support of the Royal Navy to get them out. Um, and uh, a second reason is he knows there's, you know, Alexandria is still up ahead, very wealthy city, uh, port city, not quite as, as, um, as big uh, as it had been, you know, a few decades earlier, but still one of the uh, more important ports in the United States, uh, filled with uh, lots of tobacco and flour and cotton and other uh, valuable goods. So they, they decide to, to keep going. Um, they are also hit by this storm, and several of the ships are so badly damaged that, that Gordon again considers turning back, but um, they're able to repair the ships, and um, they pass Mount Vernon, and then uh, come to Fort Washington. And by the position of Fort Washington, Gordon and his men are, are expecting, 
you know, quite a fight. Uh, it's uh, by virtue of its, it, its commanding position over the Potomac. And they, uh, they fire a few shots and they're quite astonished that there's no response. And then all of a sudden, the entire fort just goes up, this uh, huge explosion that could be heard uh, for many, many miles. It reverberates in Washington uh, and Alexandria and there's a real sense of doom when they hear this. Um, Fort Washington being the, the last real hope. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing when you think about it, is the British, here, here the citizens of Washington and the region have, have just had one British force come through and burn the White House and the Capitol, and now, uh, basically four days later, there's another British force coming up the river, and uh, this one uh, seems to be uh, even more powerful. And indeed, Gordon's squadron includes three bomb ships uh, which are very powerful are artillery ships, uh, a rocket ship, and, and two frigates. So um, those, those uh, ships alone could absolutely lay Alexandria in ashes. Uh, this is more firepower than uh, you know, any, anything that the Americans would be able to, uh, to uh, fire back at the, the British. Uh, Fort Washington goes up on the night of August 28th. Madison has just returned to Washington when he hears the explosion. And so the United States is dealing with quite a crisis, obviously. Alexandria, what does Alexandria do? You've probably seen this cartoon, it's pretty famous. Not entirely fair, there's actually a, a, a copy downstairs in the exhibits. And Alexandria uh, had a militia and it had been completely squandered by General Winder. Uh, the, the militia force, which basically consisted of, of most of the, uh, the men uh, capable of carrying arms, had been marched across the river as the British approached Bladensburg, and they'd been positioned near Fort Washington. Um, but Winder had done nothing with his force. He'd, he'd basically let them sit there during the battle. Um, and then after, after Bladensburg, uh, he orders them to cross the river and head north. So Alexandria's militia, thanks a lot, is, <laughs> is gone. And they've taken you know, most of the men and um, most of the arms that were in the city. Um, the citizens of Alexandria had gone to President Madison in May of 1813 and pointed out how vulnerable they were. And Madison had agreed, yes, you are vulnerable, but it's, it's impossible to defend every turnip patch. So he, he pretty much left the city on its own. Um, Gordon was, was not playing by General Ross's rules, and the uh, Alexandria mayor, Charles Sims, and uh, the council, you know, th this makes the stuff we went through in the 1980s look kind of petty. <laughs> that's right, <laughs> that's right. But they, they realized that their, their position was pretty untenable, uh, and uh, they uh, sent a delegation rowing out to the British, and um, offering to surrender to, to Captain Gordon immediately. And Captain Gordon says, uh, no, let's, uh, let's wait and do this properly. Uh, we haven't even reached Alexandria yet. Uh, <laughs> and he, he, uh, he does that the following day. Um, by uh, 8 o'clock in the morning on uh, August 30th, he has his, uh, his three bomb ships, the frigates, the rocket ship, laid up across the, uh, the waterfront in Alexandria, a few hundred yards out. And uh, Alexandria had a total of, of two cannon at that <laughs> point, and according to Mayor Sims, about a dozen men who could hold a rifle. Um, and Gordon is now ready to negotiate, and the, uh, the officer he sends in to the city pretty much uh, lays out conqueror's terms, uh, essentially, all valuables in the city, all uh, merchandise in the warehouses was going to be turned over to the British. Um, all ships that were still uh, in the wars at the city that hadn't been sunk uh, were going to be turned over to the British. And actually the ones that had been sunk were, were going to be uh, pulled up and uh, turned over to the British as well. Um, and a few other conditions, essentially the entire uh, wealth of the city was, uh, was going to be loaded onto the British ships and sailed out. And, uh, Mayor Sims and, and the council pretty much uh, signed on the dotted line with very little debate. And for this, 
they were roundly mocked and uh, in both in Washington, uh, Dolly Madison, who just returned to the city, called the, uh, the citizens slaves who should have had uh, allowed their city to be burned before they uh, agreed to such um, terms. And this was uh, uh, pretty harsh considering uh, her husband had pretty much left the city uh, to its fate. Um, so Alexandria didn't have much of a choice. Were they a bit unseemly in, in, in how they handled it? Yes, if, if you look at Mayor Sims's correspondence uh, where he, he just praises the British as being perfect gentlemen. And uh, in fact, uh, General uh, uh, Mayor Sims is, is outraged when um, several American officers, including uh, U.S. Navy Captain David Porter and uh, uh, Captain Charles Creighton launch a, a two-man raid into the city and try to kidnap one of the, the British um, ensigns. Uh, they were probably looking for some intelligence, but uh, Mayor Sims is afraid that this is going to uh, uh, inspire the British to burn the entire city, and in fact, it almost does. The British uh, uh, have put up their, uh, their firing signals, and Gordon is ready to uh, uh, put the city in flames before Mayor Sims is able to convince them that that this was something they had nothing to do with. But nonetheless, this was the, the image of Alexandria that uh, has, has continued through the years. Partly deserved, but not entirely. Now, it's at this point that, that um, there's a bit of a, a comeback effort being made, both by the federal government um, and by um, the Virginia militia and by the U.S. Navy. Now, James Monroe, who had been Secretary of War, has taken over also as Secretary, I'm sorry, Monroe had been Secretary of State, He's, he takes over also as Secretary of War because Armstrong has been pretty much uh, cashiered. And Monroe is eager to uh, make a stand along with uh, President Madison. They're, they're convinced that if they allow Alex, um, Georgetown and Washington to be captured again and not make an effort to capture the British as they as they sack Alexandria, um, the, <clears throat> the disgrace of losing Washington is going to be too much to, to bear. Um, Monroe, along with the Secretary of Navy, uh, William Jones, uh, put together a plan while the, the British are, are essentially looting Alexandria. In their greed, it, it's going to take them four days to load all their ships plus the 21 captured ships with all these goods. And, you know, they're really enjoying it. And, uh, drinking the wine and so forth. Uh, in the meantime, the Americans under um, uh, these three remarkable Navy officers, including uh, David Porter, Oliver Hazard Perry, and John Rogers, these, these are basically probably uh, uh, three of the finest officers we had in the Navy then. Uh, Porter uh, had, had sailed uh, into the Pacific and with his, um, with one ship had, um, done a lot of damage to, to British uh, uh, whaling interests in the Pacific. Oliver Hazard Perry, a year earlier, had, had won the great battle on Lake Erie. And John Rogers uh, was the, the senior officer in the, the uh, American Navy, very accomplished uh, veteran. And they all happened to be, uh, or they had all been brought uh, down to the Washington area as the British um, were approaching. And they'd arrived too late to save Washington, but uh, they were now in a position to try to trap the British as they left Alexandria. And uh, going back to the map here, uh, the plan that Rogers uh, puts together is to have David Porter at uh, Belvoir, now part of the fort near the, uh, the old mansion there, uh, burned out, it was already been burned at this point, sets up on a bluff. Um, Right there. Then uh, Oliver Hazard Harry, uh, Perry would take a, a second uh, battery down to Indian Head on the, uh, the naval uh, base there now, again on a bluff uh, overlooking the channel. And John Rogers would uh, launch a number of fire ships from the Navy Yard. These were uh, ships that were loaded up with flammable material, and they'd be set afire, and they would try to, to uh, set the British ships on fire. So. Uh, the British get wind by September 1st that uh, the Americans are laying a trap 
And Gordon, to his sorrow, has to leave behind about 200,000 barrels of, of goods in Alexandria because he realizes that uh, he may have waited too long at this point. And indeed, uh, as they're sailing out, one of the, um, the bomb ships runs aground uh, pretty near where the Wilson Bridge is now, a little bit uh, below that. Um, and the fire, the fire boats under uh, Rogers very nearly set it afire, but the British are able to fend that off. And then uh, they approach the Belvoir battery. The wind is, is completely dead at this point. They don't have enough wind to sail past it. And um, David Porter and the Virginia militia have set up uh, enough guns on the uh, high ground there to, to represent a bit of an obstacle for the British. And so there's some firing that goes on back and forth for five days. It's quite a, uh, quite a conflict. And uh, the Virginia militia do lose um, a number of men in this uh, firing. You have to remember that the, the bomb ships that the British had, they have three bomb ships um, in this little squadron. And those were three of the five bomb ships that uh, a few weeks later would attack Fort McHenry. So there was a lot of firepower being uh, aimed at the Virginia shore here, just uh, down river. Um, so the Americans succeed in, in holding up the British for uh, a number of days here. And the rest of the British fleet is in the Chesapeake and they can't really do anything until Gordon gets back. Um, and there's a lot of debate about exactly what the British are going to do. Uh, but by, um, by uh, let, let me go back just for one second to the, this map. Um, on September 5th, Gordon is able to blast his way past uh, the, the Belvoir battery. The winds change, and uh, he's able to use uh, use the winds to, to get past. Uh, they do suffer some casualties uh, from sharpshooters. And then they, uh, they thought they were um, clear, and then they run into Perry at uh, Indian Head. And again, one of the British ships runs aground and takes a lot of uh, American fire. But Perry, unfortunately, is not well armed. They wanted to get more uh, uh, cannons to Perry's force, but Baltimore, um, didn't want to give up its guns. So they kept the guns up there. And that was one of the reasons that uh, Perry was un unable to uh, stop the British for more than a few hours. The British finally um, sail out and reunite in the Chesapeake. And uh, that's, that's when they turn uh, September 7th. They begin sailing north towards Baltimore. And uh, again, I'm not going to go into uh, much detail about this. Um, because I want to leave time for questions. But uh, the British uh, do launch a, a dual-fisted attack on Baltimore. Again, the ground troops under Ross, uh, along with Coburn and the Marines, land at North Point, uh, while the, the bomb ships under Cochrane sail up close to Fort McHenry, which guards the mouth of uh, Baltimore Harbor and protects the, the city. Uh, General Ross is, is killed in a skirmish uh, out here where the, uh, a new American commander, General Winder, had been gracefully uh, kicked aside. <laughs> Sam Smith uh, has, has put up a very coherent defense, unlike what was uh, the case down in Washington. And he uh, has a force out here at this narrow strip of land. They, they delay the, the, the ground attack, and they kill General Ross, uh, which was a big blow for the British. And meantime, the smartest thing that was done by the United States in this entire episode, uh, they sink a number of merchant ships across the mouth uh, here between Lazaretto Point and Fort McHenry. And this means that the British, and they, they string chains between them, and this means the British aren't going to be able to sail past Fort McHenry, you know, blast their way through. They'll have to uh, reduce Fort McHenry, force its surrender before they can get uh, close enough to attack the city. And this time, there's going to be no, uh, none of this um, uh, leaving private property alone. You know, Ad Admiral Cochran was determined uh, that uh, Baltimore was going to be laid in ashes or they're going to have to pay a hefty ransom. General Ross wasn't around anymore to um, stick to the, the more gentlemanly conduct of war. Um, and again, without uh, uh, a lengthy description, this, uh, I like to include this sketch because it shows where um, Francis Scott Key 
was positioned during this bombardment. Um, he, uh, uh, of course, had, had found himself in a unique vantage point uh, during the attack. He had uh, gone to, to try to gain the uh, freedom of an American doctor who had been taken prisoner by the British. And he, he succeeds in the mission, but he's detained by the British. And Admiral Cochrane keeps him close uh, with the bombardment squadron uh, in order to, he expects to negotiate the, the surrender of, of Fort McHenry. Um, what key witnesses, and he, he's heard all the British uh, plans for uh, desolation of Baltimore. He has um, loved ones in the city. Um, he, he really believes that not only the fate of, of the city, but quite possibly the United States is is on the line as he's witnessing this uh, ferocious bombardment. Five bomb, bomb ships um, launch about 1,800 bombs. These, these are 10-inch, um, 13-inch mortars uh, weighing about 200 pounds. Uh, the British ships could fire them up to two and a half miles, uh, packed with explosives. Uh, they're also firing hundreds of rockets, which don't do a lot of damage, but do make for uh, terrific sound effects and, and visual effects. And Key, Key is seeing all this, and as he, uh, he's seen the American flag flying over Fort McHenry uh, before uh, darkness settles in. And after, after that, he's not able to, to make out the flag, but the continuing bombardment is proof uh, in his mind that uh, the fort hasn't surrendered in, in Baltimore. Uh, is still standing. Then uh, early in the morning, um, uh, after a really ferocious uh, round of firing that goes on for several hours, the, uh, the firing ceases. And uh, Key fears that this means the fort is surrendered. And um, his, um, his vision at, um, at dawn, uh, when he's able to spot the American flag, I, this is a representation that was done on the centennial, centennial of uh, the attack 100 years ago, uh, I think is a pretty, pretty good one, a little bit melodramatic, but I think it captures his, his uh, emotions pretty well. <laughs> oh, I had to include this. Um, <laughs> my, my brother is the, uh, uh, the webmaster for my, my book, and I, he, he made me promise I wasn't going to uh, Give him a shout out, but I couldn't help it. So, <laughs> Peter, thank you for uh, the website for the book. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, my question really is, after all was said and done, how did the people in Maryland and Virginia feel about our president? Well, uh, <laughs> Madison was, was very much disliked in many parts of this region. Um, he and Joshua Barney um, were blamed for bringing the British down on their heads. And, you know, Madison spends three days as a refugee after Washington Burns. I, I didn't even get into that part of the story, but, you know, he, he um, escapes by ferry uh, to what is today Roosevelt Island, then Mason's Island, along with um, John Mason, who's the son of George Mason, um, is accompanying him. Uh, they, they continue into... Um, um, basically the Falls Church region, and, and then uh, McLean. Dolly Madison has escaped as well uh, via Chain Bridge, and they do not receive a very friendly reception anywhere they go. And in fact, uh, some people try to turn them away. Um, there's, um, there's a real sense that, um, you know, this is Mr. Madison's war, and um, this was not a war that uh, many people, this, this region was quite divided on. You know, a city like Baltimore was, you know, a war city. They, they had supported the war um, enormously, but say Southern Maryland was very much opposed to the war. Other parts of Maryland were divided. Same with, uh, with Virginia. There was a lot of division as to whether um, this, uh, th this was a wise idea. So Madison's um, reputation really depends on what happens over the next couple of weeks and the fact that he comes back to Washington. A lot of people were saying, you know, let's abandon the capital, uh, move it to Cincinnati or somewhere. And um, Madison at that point, you know, after three days on, on the run, he comes back with Monroe and uh, issues a proclamation calling the British vandals, 
and um, uh, more or less declaring that you know Washington is still the capital. This is not uh, you know affected the nation. He makes sure that this news gets um, on the same ships that are going to be carrying the news of of Washington Washington's fall to um, to England and to Europe, and so. They, uh, Madison and, and uh, his advisors very much felt they needed to shape the message if they were going to come out of this, um, this debacle uh, with the country. Um, yes, what happened to the black American slaves that went over to the British side? Yeah, this is a, an amazing story. Um, the, um, uh, the colonial marines, the ones who ended up fighting um, with with the British, and this was a, a, a relatively small percentage of the of the whole. There were about 3,000, 4,000 uh, slaves in the Chesapeake region that uh, escaped. Many of them were families um, coming with children or elderly, uh, infirm, and um, many of them ended up being uh, placed on ships and sailed up to uh, Nova Scotia. Um, then you know, part of the British North America, um, where they were set free and given their freedom with absolutely no resources in the in, in the dead of winter, um, and so it was it was very um, deplorable conditions. But uh, a number, um, some of them ended up sailing away to the West Indies, but some of them stayed and settled, and they're still um, descendants of these people up there in Nova Scotia. Uh, now, with the Colonial Marines, the British were so impressed uh, with them that they wanted to keep them as part of the military, and they, they tried to make them part of the West Indies Regiment. But the Colonial Marines, you know, as a group said, no, we were promised our freedom. So the British decided they would settle them in Trinidad, uh, which they had recently acquired from, from Spain, and lots of land down there. And so in 1815, uh, they they were brought by ships down to the south coast of Trinidad, and they set up a series of towns by company. So there were, there were five companies of colonial marines. So there's a company A town, company B, and so, so on. And, and like the, the sergeant of each company would be the mayor of the town. Um, one way to avoid uh, elections. But, <laughs> but it, went, um, it went pretty well. Um, and in fact, there, there are a number of families in uh, Trinidad today that, that traced they call themselves the Americans, um, or the the other inhabitants called them the Americans, M-E-R-I-K-E-N-S, because that's just how they heard the name. Um, and so uh, many of these families um, are, are still there. And there's been a great interest among them in this bicentennial. And some of them have traveled up to this area. They've gone out to Tangier Island uh, you know, to, to see where their uh, ancestors came from. Yes. <laughs> well, that's that's a great question. Yeah, no, it, it was a uh, it was a very silly name uh, for a war that lasted three years. Um, but uh, the uh, initial name for the war was was even less imaginative. They called it the war or the late war. This was sort of the common name for for the war, the or the or the late war with Britain. So that that was the most common uh, term for uh, a number of years. Uh, there was a historian that used the, uh, the name War of 1812 about five or six years later in a, in a history he wrote. Um, but it wasn't until the, the, um, the Mexican-American War came along that calling it the Late War didn't really make sense anymore. So they, they more or less turned to the, o the other name that was in use, the War of 1812. And uh, for whatever reason, it stuck. It was used in, in more histories. And by the time of the Civil War, uh, that was pretty much the, the, the standard name for the conflict. But I, I should mention, too, that you know, in that time, you know, the War of 1812 loomed very large in, a, in the American consciousness. And really, you know, uh, through the Civil War and, and beyond, it really wasn't until the 20th century that it began to sort of fade into more obscurity, partly because of the, the Civil War and you know, other wars that, that came along. But you know, for the, those first few generations of Americans after, um, after the War of 1812, it was, you know, very much a, a part of the, the, uh, 
the American identity. Um, it, was, it was the war that really created a sense of unity um, and sovereignty and you know, led to the Monroe Doctrine and, and the American um, more established presence in the Western Hemisphere. Yes, so after the British leave the Potomac, what was the repercussions for the city of Alexandria and the men who made the decision to surrender? Did it change the politics of Alexandria? Was there any differences between the merchant classes and the citizenry or the surrounding farmers about what transpired? What happened afterwards? You know, the, 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 the government in Alexandria and the citizens were very much on the defensive. and. Um, they, were, um, they put together a committee to report to Congress about what had happened. And they wrote a, you know, a very angry uh, series of, of letters basically laying out the facts that you know, Alexandria had been abandoned by the federal government, been given no choice, its militia had been squandered. Um, you know, within Alexandria itself, I, I, never, I didn't come across too much disagreement with the course of action, you know, anybody who'd been here had seen the, the, the British force sitting off the, the water um, of Alexandria would have understood that. But, um, you know, it's interesting to think that, you know, um, a lot of uh, the people who had to stay behind in the city were the ones who were not wealthy enough to, to get away when, when the uh, British were approaching. Um, Robert E. Lee would have been, I think, seven years old at that time. Um, and uh, while the city itself wasn't uh, affected by the war, you know, his family was very much devastated by it. You know, his, his father um, had uh, uh, gone to the defense of uh, one of the newspapers in Baltimore that had questioned the wisdom of the war when it was declared. And, you know, Light Horse Harry Lee uh, was dragged out by a mob in Baltimore and, you know, beaten to a pulp they poured wax in his eyes. They tried to cut off his nose. You know, his bones were broken. And he, he, uh, he sailed. He never really returned to Alexandria after that. He sailed the West Indies and died a, a couple of years later. So um, yeah, in, in terms of how it affected the politics, you know, I wish Michael Miller <laughs> were here to, to answer that question, because that's, that's, a, that's a great one. I don't know. Uh, what happened? Why did General Winder send the militia north? You know, um, that's <laughs> there. There's so many questions about gen why General Winder did did what he did. You know, because he made so many bad decisions. Um, you know, with his with his own the main force. You know, at one point he was going to attack the British in Upper Marlboro, and he moved his force out from the city, and he was in a good position to. To, to maybe, you know, because Ross was still pretty dubious about the wisdom of this whole thing, and all it would have taken was, was one strong American stance to, to have changed his mind. But, you know, at the last minute, he loses his nerve, he, he moves the, the force back closer to the city, then all the way back to the city itself, uh, where they were in no position to, to cut off the, the British advance. Um, you know, why, the, the exact movement of, of why he did what he did with Alexandria, I mean, it's just, just one of, you know, many ludicrous decisions he made. But in his defense, he was, he was getting no support from the Secretary of War. Yes, sir. Yeah, I thought I read somewhere about uh, one of the British naval commanders, uh, in one of their reports saying something, I can't remember it was Gordon, but it, it was, uh, one of the flotilla, British flotillas that was leaving D.C. And, that, and they actually said that they suffered a lot of resistance. I was, I was thinking it might have been Belvoir Battery on their way out. And it was fact, in fact, if you just read that report, you actually would have thought that the Americans did rel relatively well. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, they, uh, uh, in fact, it was the second command uh, of, the, um, of the Potomac Squadron, um, Napier, who, who really thought that you know, the, the uh, um, Americans had acquitted themselves quite well at uh, Belvoir and again at Indian Head. Um, you know, uh, that reminds me though of, of, of something I should have mentioned about uh, the whole Alexandria episode. Uh, you know, when, when um, John Rogers is sailing down the Potomac with his, with his uh, squadron of uh, fire boats, getting ready to set the, the British on fire, he, um, he sails past Alexandria. Uh, he's a couple hundred yards offshore.
and he sees, even though the British had left the town the day before, that they're still flying a British flag. And he's so outraged that he you know, cuts off his chase of the British and comes to the wharf and orders them to take down the flag. And if, if they don't, um, he actually writes this in his report, uh, I threatened to burn down the city. And then he, he scratched that out of his final report, but you, you can see it in the original. Um, and then on his way back, after his, his attempts to set them on fire uh, fails, when he comes back to Alexandria, he's being chased actually by the British, who actually fire some shots and uh, possibly some of these shots did land in Alexandria. Um, but he sees that uh, there are several thousand pounds of beef that have been loaded up on um, the wharf that they're getting ready to ship out to the British. <laughs> you know, to, I, I don't know if it was like some sort of sale or, or what the, the situation was, but uh, Rogers put an end to that. Um, and once he arrives, he organizes a defense um, of Alexandria. So, yeah, the, the British did experience some some uh, some decent uh, response here in the Potomac. After Not the fact. after the fact. <laughs> we had last month. You may have missed uh, Patrick Butler's talks uh, last month. He talked about the Battle of the White House, this this battle by the ruins of Belvoir, and it was it was pretty extensive. I mean, we we fought back about as much as we did throughout this whole episode. But when Patrick's uh, work uh, comes out and is published, that'll that'll Okay. That, yeah. yeah, he's done a, a lot of uh, great research. He's done a lot Let's of have that. two more questions, and then we'll go downstairs and sign book. Just curious, what were the results of having declared war on Britain? I mean, we obviously didn't completely lose, but what what did they gain? Well, when when news of um, Baltimore. Well, first, uh, let me preface that by saying when the news of Washington arrives in, Wash in uh, London, there's just mass celebration, um, and there's a belief that the war is on the verge of ending, that you know, Baltimore, New York are going to be next, and this war is, is, is over. Then three weeks later, the news of, of Baltimore arrives, and together with that, uh, a British attack from Quebec into upstate New York um, ends in a, a terrible defeat for the British on Lake Champlain and Plattsburgh. And so the, the, that news arrives at the same time. Um, this completely changes the dynamic of the negotiations underway in, in Ghent. And so the British were forced to, to drop a lot of the, the demands that they were making. So the net result of the, of the Treaty of Ghent that's signed um, is basically status quo. Um, you know, none of the American demands uh, or reasons for going to war are, are pressed. The impressment, um, the, uh, the, the free trade, but it, it didn't matter anymore because with the war ending, the British weren't impressing American sailors anymore and the trade restrictions had already uh, been, been dropped. So um, in that sense, the war didn't change anything. But in, other, in a more important sense, it, it really, um, as I alluded to earlier, did change the American position in North America. It, it really, the war was uh, really about the future of the North American continent in a way. And you know, the United States really had eyes on expansion northward into Canadian territory. And in that sense, um, it was pretty clear after this war ended that our expansion was not gonna be north, but it was gonna be west. And we pretty much, the United States had a clear path west after this because the, you know, the British had alliances with the Native American tribes um, in the Midwest, in that region, but they were pretty much ripped asunder by the war. Even though the, the British um, gave lip service to keeping them intact, uh, in reality, they, uh, those treaties were worthless at that point, and you know, the Americans just ignored them and uh, were able to, to move westward. And, and Monroe issues the Monroe Doctrine and you know what Francis Scott Key captured, um, you know his his um, song when it's printed within days in, in Baltimore and then up and down the East Coast, you know that that um, that created like a new uh, image that not only leads to the you know the the U.S. flag becoming the icon that it is, but it also you know created a sense of union that really hadn't existed. You know we'd been more of a uh, collection of states. Uh, beforehand, and, and now there was a, a greater sense of union. Um, a number of um, commentators at the time felt, the, and the uh, also the um, 
a greater sense of American sovereignty in that the British um, weren't, um, weren't really going to trample uh, over American rights anymore. It was pretty, it was pretty clear at that point. The, uh, both the United States and Great Britain, uh, I think, emerged from the war with a grudging respect and also a, a grudging fear about going to war again because they both suffered uh, fairly extensively. Why did the British send him to New Orleans? I'm sorry. Why did they send Coburn to New Orleans? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I think Cochran, and I apologize for the similar names there, Cochran and, and Coburn, it, it's kind of uh, uh, frustrating. In fact, uh, the great irony is that both Coburn and, and Cochran, the, the guys who burnt Washington, including the Library of Congress, their papers are now at the Library of Congress. <laughs> and, <laughs> If you go to the manuscript division, their, their uh, papers are in the file, one right after the other. Uh, how's that for irony? Um, but they didn't like each other. Cochran uh, really um, resented what Coburn had done. He had, in fact, Cochran had, had issued orders at one point to, to break off the attack on Washington, and, and Coburn had ignored that. Um, Cochran hadn't really been interested in, in attacking Baltimore just yet, uh, and Coburn had been pressing it. I think uh, Cochran um, uh, really, New Orleans was Cochran's great goal. He felt that this was where the war was going to be won, and this is, you know, the Great Britain would, would sort of gain control of the Mississippi. Um, and I think part of it, he wanted to keep the glory for himself and not have, you know, Coburn showing him up or, or ignoring his orders. So. Uh, he sends him down to Georgia to, to do some damage down there, and then he uh, sails off to, to capture the glory of New Orleans for himself. And that, of course, doesn't work out too well. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, two more quick comments. Uh, Bill Dickinson is going to mention uh, another upcoming event, which we neglected to mention at the beginning, but also to ease the, and I see a few more copies in people's hands, to ease the crush on the paperbacks, uh, Steve did bring some hardcover uh, copies with him. The hardcover is no longer available for us to purchase through the store, but we will have uh, another stack of these uh, soft covers if you want to come back next week if they do sell out tonight. So thank you. Bill. Well, if you've enjoyed this, uh, there's more to come. Um, next month, June the 14th, it's a Saturday. We're going to have a cruise on the Potomac River where you actually, it will go from Alexandria down to roughly Fort Belvoir and come back up. It'll be in the evening. It'll be a dinner cruise on Miss Kristen. Uh, we can handle about 100 folks on board. Uh, we have uh, about 39 seats remaining. So if you want to grab a seat, um, go to the Gadsby's Tavern uh, website and in their store. So this way you actually can feel it, see it, and enjoy it while you're meeting other people. And on that cruise, we will be flying this flag, a 15-star flag, which was given to us by National Capital Flag, made in the United States, I might add. Um, and made here in Alexandria, which I think is pretty good. Um, also, on August the 31st, we are going to have a signature event on the waterfront. And there were, it's going to be a lot of festivities. Not, it'll be commemoration. We're going to have uh, the Navy there, the Marines there. Uh, we will probably have some units from the British Navy because they rather like this event. You could say they won this round. So they've been more than cooperative, and we're going to have some athletic events, including a yacht race up the Potomac River between a British yacht and an American yacht, see where that goes. A tug of war, that seems to be setting up very well. Our secret weapon is our fire department. Um, <laughs> they think, I just met the, this guy at the British Embassy who is a, like a linebacker, and he was talking up the, t the tug of war. And I said, oh, you're going to be in the tug of war. He said, no, I was a small one. I'm the coach. <laughs> so I don't know what's, what's going to come there. 
Um, also, in September, we hope, cross our fingers, we'll have another view of this event uh, given by Professor Andrew Lambert. Uh, it'll be on September the 3rd or 4th, we're not sure yet. He's from King's College, and he's just written a new book on um, Captain Napier, who was the um, captain of the, of the Uralis, the other frigate that came up with Gordon. And he wrote quite a bit on his observations, uh, as was mentioned, on, um, on Alexandria. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming out. Please consider membership in our society, your society. And if you have ideas for lectures, articles, um, or just things we ought to be doing differently, or new opportunities, please approach one of the board members or send us a note on our email site. So with that, books are for sale and thanks for coming out.